If any of you already knew about SunSketcher or have plans about SunSketcher, now's your time to go ahead and add some, uh, some interesting questions to the Q&A that we'll get to at the end of this section. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our, uh, our friends Gordon and Andrea, and I'll go ahead and stop talking and mute myself while they tell me when to switch the slides. But it is all you two. Go for it. Okay, good morning, that's better. I'm Gordon, this is Andrea, she's a computer science student. I'm a professor of physics at Western Kentucky University. And we've been working on the SunSketcher project for about a year now. And we want literally a million people to help us <laughs> with, um, with our scientific objective, which I'll discuss that a little bit. And then Andrea will join in and talk about how it kind of works in practice. So next slide, please, Emma. Okay. The moon is not a perfect round object. It has mountains, it has valleys, and we know this shape of the moon very, very precisely. So just before totality happens during an eclipse, sunlight can just make it through the valleys between the mountains on the limb. These are called Bailey's beads, first seen by a Francis Bailey in the 19th century. And you can get some very pretty pictures of Bailey's beads. You see those on the left. You can predict Bailey's beads on the right to see when they should happen and how long they should last for. But it's important to know that that prediction depends very sensitively on the assumed size and shape of the sun on the light behind the moon. And this is where citizen scientists can help. By taking photographs of the Bailey beads with your smartphone using the SunSketcher app, we'll get a better idea of how big the sun is and what shape it is by examining exactly when the Bailey beads appear, when they disappear. Many people are concerned that the actual quality of the image they're gonna get with a smartphone with no solar filter, no telescope on the front. I agree, the images will be rather boring to look at, but they contain very valuable scientific information, name of the timing. Each phone will take 101 images during uh, the eclipse. They're automatically programmed within the app. And by looking at the time when the little flashes of light go on and off, we'll be able to put all these observations together and determine the size and shape of the sun. Next slide, please. So how do you play? Very simple. I'm going to hand this over to Andrew in a minute. But if you download the App Store or Google Play, uh, it's available for both uh, iPhones and Android phones. This is what the start page looks like. We advise people to read the tutorial, uh, just a short series of still frames. If you want to learn more, you can click on that link and that'll take you to our website where you can read much more about what we're trying to do and how you can help do it. Um, once you pass through the app, uh, you'll say, are you in a position where you'll be viewing the eclipse? You must be within the band of totality. You need not be close to the center line. In fact, we value observations at different distances from the center line, different vantage points. Just make sure you're roughly where you're going to put the phone down. Put the phone down within a few meters of where you are because we're going to use the phone's GPS coordinates in our data analysis. The question I get a lot is, uh, do I need to be on the internet for this to work? And the answer is no. Uh, once you've downloaded the app, it is completely autonomous. It knows where it is, and therefore will calculate when to take the pictures. We ask you just put the phone down, don't hold it, and leave it completely stationary. When it's over, especially an iPhone will flash its little light at you, and you will then get a screen showing you the pictures that you just took, and we ask your permission to upload them for later analysis. Uh, next slide, I'm going to pass the headset here over to Andrea. Yeah. All right. Hello, everybody. So what we're going to do here is once you have your phone set down in a stable location, you're going to make sure that rear camera is what is pointing at the sun. Do not set it where your front camera, like selfie mode, is pointing at it. Flip it over. Make sure that back camera is facing the sky. And in about a minute or so after totality ends, you can pick up your phone. Like Gordon said, um, it, the iPhone will flash at you. You'll know that you're good to go. If you're really cautious, you can wait maybe even five minutes before you pick it up, but there's really no need to do that. Um, next slide, please. 
So on the day of the eclipse and leading up to it, we will be super active on our social medias, which you can follow us at SunSketchers. Um, right now we're super active on Instagram, but we'll be posting more on TikTok and X slash Twitter, if you still know it by its old name, uh, leading up to and on day of. We'll be doing some fun little games where we ask you guys to kind of participate with us, show us where you're at, what you're doing. Um, we'll be encouraging a lot of eclipse safety while we're there, encouraging you to wear those glasses, kind of participating in some trends on that front. Um, we also hope to have a map on our website that's kind of going to do some really cool stuff. I'll let Gordon explain that map here in just a second, but please, please, please be sure to follow us on socials, and I'll pass this back to Gordon. Yeah, we'll quickly discuss the map. Basically, when uh, a set of data is transmitted to us, uh, we will know the latitude and longitude of that phone. We will not know whose phone it is. I want to stress there's no what we call personal identifiable information transmitted. We don't know the phone number. We don't know who you are, but we know where you were. And we'll add a dot to a map. And we hope to get this kind of river of dots, river of data flowing as the eclipse moves at 2000 miles an hour from the Mexico, Texas border all the way to Maine. And by advertising this, we hope that people will say, well, I want to be a dot on a map too. So if you live in Indianapolis, and you see the string of dots has already reached Arkansas. You have about 10 to 15 minutes to download the app. It takes about three seconds and set your phone up and you can be a dot on a map too. We think this is an interesting way of encouraging people to participate. And with that, I'll hand it back to Emma. Awesome. Yeah, this is one of those projects where it's, I really like it because it allows you to just kind of set it down and experience the eclipse in a lot of different ways and however you'd like to. So I keep recommending to people that I know who are traveling, especially if you're in a group, if you're trying to take pictures during the eclipse, first of all, experience it instead. But also uh, if one of you uses your camera or your phone for this versus the rest of you, I'm excited for you because I think it's a really good, solid one for that. Um, you do have two questions in the uh, Q&A so far. So um, I, I do know the answer to this one, but will the sun burn my iPhone's eye? What did we learn about the cameras on phones? Uh, we worry about that for a lot. But when we did a, a what's called a beta test of this back in October for the annual eclipse, we had phones exposed to a crescent sun for quite a long period of time. Uh, pictures completely overexposed, but they did no damage whatsoever to the phones. So we're fairly confident that that shouldn't happen. If you want to use a solar filter, you're welcome to, but you get better quality of image, frankly, if you don't. We will be taking pictures with a one eight thousandth of a second exposure time. So the amount of light coming into your phone's camera is actually going to be very small. Can I use a tripod to hold my phone to record pictures for the eclipse? Uh, yes, uh, using a tripod would be great. Anything stable, uh, put it up against a rock, point it in the general direction of the sun. You can use the sun's, sh uh, the phone's shadow to make sure you're pointed in the general direction of the sun. The angle should be about the elevation of the sun, but most smartphones have a pretty wide field of view. So as long as you're fairly confident you're looking at it, you should be good. Awesome. And then there was another question about using it on a tablet of any sort. Um, the app still works on tablets or is that a no? We've asked that. I, I, I will speak. I'm not sure but detailed uh, specification for different products. But I do know that certain iPads, especially if they're Wi-Fi enabled, will receive GPS signals and therefore will be able to participate. So if it has an internet capability and GPS capability on a camera, it should be good. Gotcha. That's good to know. Um, Can the Sun Sketcher app be used outside of the United States? Unfortunately, no. One of the things we have to be careful of, especially in the Citizen Science Project, is that we respect privacy laws. I already mentioned they will not be uploading your information of who you are, what your phone number is. In order to ensure we are compliant with all privacy laws, we have to stick with the ones we know about which are the ones in the United States. So unfortunately, if you're in Mexico or Canada, uh, you will not be able to participate in this one, but stay tuned for 2026, where we'll be doing this again in Greenland, Iceland, and Spain, and we'll set up differently there. Oh, catch me in Iceland, that'd be cool. Ah, I'm excited, okay. Um, I'm gonna turn into an eclipse station. 
uh, where can I use the Sunsketcher app? So uh, I'm assuming you mean within where you're watching from. So it was within the path of totality, but not on the central line. Is that right? Well, on central line, if you want, but just you have a hundred mile wide swath on 2000, you have you know, 200,000 square miles to choose from. <laughs> excellent. Yeah. Um, this is excellent. All right. I think we're out of questions. I'm just double checking to make sure. Oh. Uh, able to be used in Lake George. Is Lake George within the United States? I'm not sure. I would not know immediately where Lake George was, but if you look at a standard eclipse map, if the path of totality passes through Lake George and is in the United States, then the answer is yes. Excellent. Then the answer is... If it's in upstate New York, York yep, it should be good. And then Denver, yep, within the United States, as long as... De oh, wait, Denver is not... Is that within the path? I'm not actually sure. I can't remember geography. <laughs> Go ahead and check out the eclipse map. Actually, uh, Roland, can you drop the time and date website for the eclipse path? That one's a good one. Um, there's another one that Gordon actually recommended to me, and I can't remember what it's called. <laughs> uh, but there is another one that you can find where you are in the eclipse path or where it's closest. So if if there's an eclipse path near you and the central or the path of totality, um, you'll be able to see it there. Awesome. All right. These are great questions. I'm going to go ahead and move us forward. If anything else comes up, feel free to add it to the Q&A as well. We're going to start talking about um, our lovely Eclipse soundscape. So Mary Kay, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks. Hi, I'm Mary Kay Severino, the Education Director at Arisa Lab. I co-lead the Eclipse Soundscapes project alongside Dr. Henry Trey Winter, who's the Chief Scientist at Arisa Lab. Next slide. The Eclipse Soundscapes project is studying how life on Earth, specifically wildlife, is affected by solar eclipses. And by participating, you are helping us answer this science question. During a solar eclipse, the moon slowly creeps in front of the sun, blocking the sun's light from reaching the Earth. And during the minutes before, during, and after eclipse maximum, when most or all of the sun is blocked, it's going to seem like dusk or night has come early. And we know that nature looks, sounds, and feels differently during dusk and night and dawn and day. Different animals and insects appear and start making noises at these different times. Of some are out at night, like crickets or owls. Some come out in the morning. As the sun starts to rise, you start to hear a dawn chorus, often with birds singing. And so solar eclipses can seem like a very sped up version of the day-night cycle. And so when there is a solar eclipse, this is happening in the middle of what should be daytime. So we're interested in understanding how nature and specifically animals respond to solar eclipses. And this is something that scientists have been wondering for a while. Almost 100 years ago, a scientist named Wheeler asked people to mail letters to him and his colleagues with their eclipse observations. And their observations included visual and sound observations on how the 1932 total solar eclipse affected nature. And this showed that eclipses can be studied and experienced in a multi-sensory way. You'll see things, you'll feel things like temperature drop. You might hear different sounds. The Eclipse Soundscapes Project is revisiting Wheeler's 100-year-old study with modern means of communication and modern technology. We're not asking people to mail us in letters and we're not posting this in the newspaper. Instead, we're on SciStarter and reaching out via technology. And we are asking you, all of the general public, to get involved just like Wheeler did 100 years ago. Eclipse Soundscapes observers will observe the sights and sounds during the eclipse using whatever senses are available to them. Take notes and then submit those observations via a web form on EclipseSoundscapes.org after the eclipse, but before April 15th. And you can be located anywhere. You can be on the eclipse path, you can be near it, you could be completely off the eclipse path. And to be an Eclipse Soundscapes observer, no equipment is necessary. Next slide. Because we want to understand if animals respond similarly or differently from a regular day-night cycle, we'd like you to observe and take notes during three different time frames: before eclipse maximum, during eclipse maximum, and after eclipse maximum. Solar eclipses take several hours. Eclipse maximum happens in the middle, 
and lasts for about three to five minutes. This is when the most possible amount of the sun is covered. If you're on the eclipse path, the eclipse maximum is totality, when all of the sun will be blocked from view. If you are near or off the eclipse path, this is when the most possible amount of the sun will be blocked from view, but it won't be all of it. Eclipse Soundscapes observers should use whatever senses are available to them and take notes on what you hear, what you see, and what you feel outside in nature around you for at least 10 minutes before eclipse maximum, during the three to four minutes of eclipse maximum, and at least 10 minutes after eclipse maximum. And be as specific as you can. If you know the species of any animals that you hear or see, definitely write this down. If you don't know the specific details, that's okay. Just put as much information as you have. And scientists take lots of field notes when they're out in the field. As an eclipse soundscapes observer, that's what you're doing during the April 8th eclipse. So in addition to these multi-sensory observations, your field notes should include latitude and longitude in decimal degrees format, a description of your surroundings, like are you in a city park, are you in a field, in a city environment, a suburban environment, and the start and stop time of your observation, and make sure to include your time zone. If this seems like a lot to remember, don't worry. You can download a field notes paper from the observer section on eclipsesoundscapes.org to use on April 8th. There's also information on eclipsesoundscapes.org to help you find your latitude and longitude, as well as lots of other resources. And um, Emma mentioned the time and date map. There's also a way to determine if you are on or near the eclipse path on the eclipsesoundscapes.org website using your zip code. I'll just point out, though, that zip codes can be big areas if you are in unpopulated regions, so they are approximate. Um, after the eclipse, you must enter your observation on the eclipsesoundscapes.org website. And within the observation form, you will have the opportunity to enter your SciStarter email if you'd like to get SciStarter credit for your participation in Eclipse Soundscapes. And once you submit your observations and location information, you will receive a certificate that you can download and print. Next slide. Um, we will be active before, during, and after the eclipse on Instagram and Facebook. You can follow us at Eclipse Soundscapes. We will be posting a map with the approximate locations of Eclipse Soundscapes observers on the website in the days before um, the eclipse, and then as data comes in after the eclipse. And we also invite you to share about your eclipse experience on social media using hashtag Eclipse Soundscapes. What did you hear? What did you see? Was it amazing? We want to know. That's it. Awesome. Oh, some great information. I'm really excited about this one because it seems like a lot of families are really invested in this one just because their kids are learning how to do those multi-sensory observations too. So um, I've talked to a lot of families about this one, especially, uh, and I myself am excited to do it because um, I can do it simultaneously while doing SunSketcher, I think. Yeah, I can do, I'm going to try to do all three, um, all four actually, technically. So we do have a couple questions and some of them relate to a question that you're actually trying to answer, right? So questions about like human behavior versus animal behavior, horse behavior specifically. Um, and did we uh, see changes like in 2017? So do you wanna just give a general understanding of um, what we have learned so far? I know you you briefly touched on, I'll actually go back to that slide too um, for what we know already, but have you experienced any of the different behavior yourself too? Um, so we didn't conduct this in 2017, so we don't have any of our own um, information from 2017, but we do know that the National Park Service did conduct some studies and they did find some differences um, using audio recording devices out in some of their parks. We also know that Wheeler 100 years ago got lots of anecdotal evidence, people mentioning that during totality there were tons of crickets. Um, another scientist uh, in 2017 described it like a, a cricket light switch when totality began. Suddenly night insects were out making noise. And then all of a sudden when totality ended, it was like the light switch switched off. <laughs> so there's a lot of information out there. And I know some people are going to be in colder regions. So you might not hear crickets, but 
personally, I'm interested to know, are people going to hear hooting owls? And I'm people are also in lots of um, city areas along the path. I'd be interested to know what happens in a city. What if you're in New York City? Does all the traffic stop? Do people suddenly stop doing construction work if there's an eclipse going on, I think that's interesting too. And I'm hoping that we get to learn more about all of these different things and all sorts of different animals. Absolutely. There is another project that is, um, it, we're actually talking about it next week too. So if you're particularly interested in animal behavior, there is a group trying to do very specific um, animal only. So not looking at multi-sensory per se, but just animals in general. So if any of you end up at a zoo, especially they're looking for observations. So not exactly the same. Um, and definitely, uh, yeah, but if you're interested, you can, you can join us again next week to talk about that one too. Uh, Cause it's definitely, uh, another I know one. what project you're talking about and we are actually partners with them and we're oh, sharing yeah. data back and forth. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say, I bet you could probably do both simultaneously because mm -hmm. it would double dip in uh, in data too. Uh, yeah, apparently if anyone is interested in particularly weird experiences during 2017, apparently giraffes were galloping. Um, so if you want to see <laughs> random animals do very strange things and just do uh, like bird calls that have never been heard before, I think was another one they saw. And some very interesting things about the Galapagos turtles, but tortoises, but I think there might be children on the call. So I'll hold off on that one. Mm -hmm. uh, so <laughs> interesting behavior. I'm glad you guys are sharing the the data then. Um, I think there were a couple more. Uh, do we have any information about animals that, oh, are there any animals during uh, experiencing hibernation during April? So I wonder if this would impact them still, but I think they might all be out of hibernation at that point. I think they would just stay asleep, Lauren <laughs> or Asker. <laughs> any idea? I don't have an idea about that, um, <laughs> but my guess would be the same as yours. <laughs> yeah, just... They're either still asleep or they're already out, so they would just be um, doing it. Um, for anyone who's asking about uh, where to get eclipse glasses, by the way, for eclipse glasses, eclipse safety, I'll actually send it in our um, in our follow up email. I'll send you some links for that um, from NASA, so I'll make sure to add that one in because uh, I don't have a link with with me right now. Um, awesome. And then I think there was one more. Oh, weather. Do we know if uh, weather will affect the soundscapes data collection? Have you seen that from the annular eclipse? Um, I mean, people should observe whether it's cloudy or rainy or sunny, uh, because there still should be a change in the light. So, and that's really what's affecting animals. It should still get darker. If it's already dark because it's cloudy, it should still theoretically get darker. So it's just this idea of the day-night cycle happening in the middle of daytime. And we have cloudy dusk times and rainy dusk and evening switches too. So, um... I don't know how it will affect it. That's part of the fun of science, but we definitely still want the observations because these are multi-sensory sound, what you see, what you feel, whatever's available to you. And so even if you might not be able to use your eclipse glasses and look at what's going on, you can be looking around you and figuring out what's going on in your environment. Excellent. Um, there is one last question about plants. Um, if they, If we should observe plants as well, if they'll be affected by the eclipse? Do we have any record of that happening? I feel like there are some that might do something weird if it suddenly becomes nighttime, although it might be too fast. I'm pretty certain I heard of a group doing that, but I can't remember who they are, where they're out of. So since we don't have lots of eclipses, write down your observations and maybe you'll figure out who they are and you're able to send that to them. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. I'm curious. I'll be looking at plants too. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and move us forward. So if you have questions already, uh, knowing about the Globe Observer Eclipse uh, protocol, you can go ahead and add them in. I'm going to go ahead and spotlight our last friend here. Replace spotlight. There we go. Um, so Kristen, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Go for it. Yes, thank you. So um, as Emma mentioned, I'm Kristen Weaver. I'm the deputy coordinator for the, the Globe Observer Citizen Science app that's part of the larger global learning and observations to benefit the environment program. So I'm going to tell you about our specific eclipse tool. So if you want to go to the next slide. 
So what we're looking at is specifically how the eclipse is affecting those solar powered processes in the atmosphere, like air temperature, clouds and wind, and specifically measuring air temperature and clouds, although we're interested if people notice changes in the wind. And if you have instruments to measurement, measure that there are some things you can do. So if you think about, you know, the heat, the, the sun heating the Earth's surface is creating uh, is, is creating clouds through convection and other processes. And so we really want to observe some of those changes. Um, and we're, so we're getting people to do observations of those things. And in past eclipses in 2017, we looked a lot at air temperature and clouds just sort of generally, but we're, we're actually adding a little bit more that we're trying to look at for the, the, um, for 20, the 2023 annular, as well as the April eclipse coming up soon and adding some investigations in terms of, are there differences in, uh, if there's different land cover types and climate zones where those observations are taking place. So that bottom image is actually actually some work done by a researcher at NASA Langley Research Center, Ashley Artur, who started to look at the annular eclipse data and changes in the clouds across the eclipse period for the annular based on those different climate zones. I know that's too small to see. I'm going to put into the chat. Uh, she and our clouds project scientist, Marle Colon Robles, uh, just did a, a blog post uh, with some more details about that if you want to know more about that. So if you want to go to the next slide, please. So how to participate, we are also, we are, we are an app like the Sun Sketcher one. So you can download the Globe Observer app and set up an account. And you do want to do that a bit ahead of time and get that all taken care of. Um, also, you don't need, uh, you don't need the internet to do the data collection, but you do need the internet to obviously download the app and to get connected to the Globe database. So do try to do that ahead of time. You will need a thermometer, some type of thermometer that can measure air temperature. So you can see, you know, yes, it can be digital. It can be, you know, an old school liquid filled thermometer. What we don't want you to do is just rely on the weather app on your phone for the temperature because we don't know exactly where that data is coming from. The, the weather station that it's pulling from could be kind of far away. Now, if you have a weather station actually at your site, if you have a home weather station or if you're at a, an event that has a weather station, that's fine. But we just want to make sure the data is being collected from right, right where you are. Um, that we're asking you, you know, there's a little, there's a brief in-app training for clouds and land cover, and you can try some practice observations. We actually have a challenge going on right now about focused on clouds that sort of wraps around the eclipse. So now through April 15th, we're specifically looking for clouds observations. And then of course, especially observations on eclipse day, but clouds and land cover are always in the app. Uh, and so you can try those now and submit data to the database now. And then the eclipse tool is actually there now. It's in practice mode at the moment. So you can go through and see what the interface looks like and do you know, test your thermometers, you know, make sure you, you've got that all sorted out. Um, and the, the data just doesn't go into the database right now, but it'll go into live data collection on April 1st. So this is all kind of stuff to get ready ahead of time and things you can practice on now. If you go to the next slide. On the day of the eclipse, you can see um, kind of in the middle of the slide there, that's what the app interface looks like in the, in, the, in the Globe Observer app. What we want you to do is take a single land cover observation to kind of set the scene. What is it, what, are, you, are you in a parking lot? Are you in a grassy field? Are you in you know, a forest? Although hopefully you have a view of the sky to be able to see the eclipse. And then make sure your thumb thermometer is set up. Um, we want you, it needs, it should be shaded and in a well-ventilated area. So not necessarily under an umbrella. It's a good thing you, you know, hang it under a table or a, or a, a, a camp chair or whatever you're observing, but the, the probe should be in the shade uh, and not in direct sunlight. Um, and then we're looking for uh, taking temperature measurements every five to 10 minutes. The app actually will remind you of that. It starts out at every 10 minutes and then will increase to five minutes for about half an hour before and after maximum eclipse. You can take more frequent than that. But and if you miss one, just do an observation as soon as it reminds you. But five to 10 minutes will will help you get that. You can see the example graph on the left. You get that nice curve of the dip in temperature and then the increase in temperature. I will say this is part of that multi-sensory experience that um, that Mary Kay was talking about because you will be able to feel the temperature drop. And so this is actually just quantifying how much that temperature drops. And it pairs very well, the person who was asking about weather and the animal behavior, 
Uh, this pairs very well with taking those eclipse soundscapes observations. Uh, and then also clouds observations every 15 to 30 minutes. Uh, and then if you see something interesting happening in the sky, for example, if the if, if convective clouds like cumulus clouds start dissipating right before the eclipse, that's a great time to take a, a, a an observation. However, we definitely want you to put down your phones uh, and uh, and and don't 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 interfere with totality. Put down your phones and then pick them back up to continue the temperature observations afterwards. We don't want I mean, we're we're looking for. The, the period about an hour or two before and after maximum eclipse. So really sort of the whole period of the partial eclipse, if you can. Now, if that's too much, if you're not at your eclipse site, do whatever you can. But if you do that full hour or two before and after the maximum eclipse or totality, you're more likely to get that nice curve of seeing the full change in temperature. So that's day of the eclipse. Uh, and then if you wanna go to the next slide, Oh, and I guess there was a little video. Oh, there it is. If you want to hit play. So we will, we are going to be on um, Facebook, X and Instagram. Um, and oh, yes, I don't, maybe it won't, maybe it doesn't, maybe it didn't. Okay. Maybe when you downloaded it, it, it was playing in the Google slides, but that's fine. That's just an example from 2017 of the eclipse data that we collected. We will have a similar display on our website, a live map that'll show the data as it's, uh, as it comes in and you can see it across the path. Um, and then we are actually going to have some specific connection se sessions, what we call Globe Observer Connect sessions on April 2nd to ask any last minute questions before the eclipse and April 25th to get uh, a, sort of a preliminary report on how much data we got and uh, any pr preliminary results we have and to share your experiences so you have anything else that comes up. And that's uh, the, the URL for that is there, observer.globe.gov slash go dash connect. So I, I think something being the third one to go, I think all of these three I mean, could actually mesh pretty well in terms of sharing things uh, and I think uh, and, and doing doing bits and pieces or if you're observing with multiple people kind of trading off who's doing who's writing down the notes about animal behavior, who's entering the air temperature data. And, and you know, they really can all be part of the full eclipse experience and getting the data from the full a full uh, the full eclipse experience. I love that. Thanks. Yeah, it does seem like you can definitely like team up, especially if you're in, uh, if you're more than one person, you can definitely make all these projects and probably the solar eclipse safari that'll be talked about next week, um, kind of include them all in your experience, which would be wild. And imagine being able to say how much you contributed to science uh, during the, this eclipse. That's incredible. Um, I'm actually going to drop my screen share to see if I can get that video up while we answer the question. So, yeah, and it was just uh, to demonstrate that it says, but also, oh, another thing I meant to mention related to that, we want observations from anywhere that's experiencing even a partial eclipse. So I think, you know, that the first one the, that was lo looking just on totality, eclipse soundscapes is sort of, you know, I think, I think Mary Kay about 70% totality. Anywhere that's experiencing the eclipse at all, even a partial eclipse, we're happy to have observations from there. Now, you will not see as much of a temperature effect, of course, if you have less, um, uh, if you have less, uh, if, if you're in an area of less eclipse, but we still want your data. You can see there, we were getting observations from all over the U.S. You can see kind of those pinks in the in the eastern U.S. dropping as the eclipse shadow. And I do want to note, this is an animation I made afterwards, so the eclipse shadow isn't on our website. That's something I added afterwards, but the map looks the same. But you can see all of those observations. We had about 80,000 air temperature measurements in, uh, in, in August of 2017. So we're hoping, hoping for at least as many, if not more, if possible, because uh, um, for, for, for coming up in April. Um, and I think I saw some questions in yeah. the chat. Yeah. So the, uh, the, the reason that you want the temperature to be shaded um, is that if you have direct sunlight on the, the bulb of your thermometer or the probe of the temperature, um, that's going to, the direct sunlight is going to, the temperature is going to be higher, that thermometer temperature is going to be higher than actually the ambient air temperature. So it doesn't need to be necessarily a shaded area. Honestly, if you've got a camping chair and you're, you know, some whatever, or, or you know, a folding chair that you're sitting on, if you just kind of want to like get the, the probe part or the thermometer kind of in the shade under the chair, I mean, even your own shadow is better than nothing. Um, but you could get a piece of cardboard to shade the thermometer. The, the point is that if you have the direct sunlight on the thermometer, it's going to be a higher temperature 
temperature than the actual ambient air temperature. So that's why we need it shaded. So, um, and yeah, ideally above the ground because you're trying to get air temperature. So, um, so whether you kind of like hold it in your shadow to do the measurements, maybe set it on the ground or set it to the side and then hold it on the, 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 the hold it in your shadow to the air temperature. But again, the reason for that is just because we're trying to get air temperature and, and not necessarily surface temperature. Although you, there, there are, uh, there's some globe teachers who are doing some surface temperature measurements. That's not part of the globe eclipse tool, but yeah, ideally it should should be in sort of above the ground just because we're trying to get air temperature and not ground temperature. Um, um, I think you answered both of them. I would yeah, I think got those. And again, I think I saw a question in the chat or a comment about half an hour before and after. It's like, so again, ideal world is about two hours or so before and after. But if you can only do half an hour before and half an hour after, or even if you can only do 10 minutes before and after, um, some data is better than no data. But I think if you want to get that nice full curve of seeing the highest temperature down to the lowest temperature, you do want to do like as, as much time as you can collect the data, you'll get a better graph. Um, one thing that's also interesting, the lowest temperature based on the 2017 data tends to be a little bit after after maximum eclipse. So again, you want to make sure you don't stop at totality, go at least a little bit. I mean, put the phone down during totality, but take a couple of measurements after totality because the lowest temperature tends to be a little bit after. Um, and you will probably notice we have uh, the, 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 the research that we did in 2017. If it's cloudier, uh, it, then you will tend to have less of a drop in temperature than if it's clear skies. There's about a 40% difference between fully overcast, or at least the, the, the paper that was published after the 2017 eclipse, about a 40% difference in the temperature drop between clear skies versus fully overcast. Again, you know, that's mostly on totality. It's going to depend if you're not on, full, on, the, on the path of totality and um, uh, and and some other factors because um, you know, of course weather is kind of complicated, right? So you know you can have a cold front coming in that has nothing to do with the convective clouds that are going to be affected by the sun's energy. So it can be kind of complicated. Definitely. Um, and we do have one more question that is uh, related actually to one of my next slides in a couple of seconds here. So I'm going to hold off on your question, Carlin. But for anyone who's thinking I want to do all these, but now my brain is too full of knowledge. Totally okay. We have a resource for you to kind of organize your thoughts and organize how you'll do it um, that I will send in a minute. Um, if you're in an urban area, does it make a difference, uh, Kristen? Uh, it probably, it very well may. And that's one of the reasons actually why we're looking for that land cover observation to set the scene so we know where you're observing from. Um, we did not have that tool in the app in, in, in 2017 during the last time we got a lot of data collection. So uh, that's actually one of the things that we want to look at is how uh, what are the differences between that. But in general, urban areas that have a lot of pavement are going to be, um, are going to have on average the urban heat island effect, if you've heard about that. Urban areas with a lot of pavement are going to tend to be warmer than surrounding rural areas that may be more trees or, or grass and things like that. So urban area versus rural, but also within that urban area, area are you in a parking lot versus a park there may be some differences there as well um, so some of that is to be determined but definitely tell us about where you're taking your observations excellent um, we're doing great on time if anyone has more questions feel free to drop them in the chat oh what about taking temperatures in the area yep. that is only 91 Absolutely. Please take it. I mean, again, we're, we're, at, we're, we'd love to get observations, even areas that are maybe experiencing only 20% eclipse. Now you're probably not going to see as much effect. If any, you might not notice much effect. It might be harder to pick out what's the eclipse effect versus what's just like normal weather effects of changes in temperatures during the day. But we're absolutely interested in temperatures from anywhere that's experiencing any any amount of eclipse, but just be aware that you you may not see as much temperature drop. And, and I think that's actually something that I'm not sure we've done the full analysis of is how much percent, how much, what percentage of, of, of uh, eclipse do you need to really see a noticeable temperature drop? That's not something that we've necessarily poked into the data about yet, but something that I hope to do after this eclipse. Excellent. Yes, and Wyoming, yes, that's great. And um, even I, I don't remember exactly how much uh, percentage you'll get, but Wyoming is great. Uh, really, all of the U.S., uh, even Hawaii is going to get some eclipse, not all of Alaska. Um, and, oh, I would meant to mention this. 
in our case, the GLOW program is an international program. So it does actually work in Mexico and Canada because we've the, the, the U.S. government has made international agreements with the governments from other. So it's actually the GLOW programs in 127 countries around the world. Uh, but we've made international agreements about being able to collect that citizen science data. So it does work in, in Mexico and Canada. Um, so it is that GLOBE Observer will work there. Great. Um, if any of you are writing in the chat too about uh, where you're coming in from or you're familiar with anyone else's area too that they're adding, feel free to add recommendations if you know of um, events happening about that. I know there was one question about uh, where to go for animals or locations, if it's a good spot. Um, if you're familiar, go for it. The uh, we do have an open time if you have any more questions, so I'll keep an eye on, um, I'll keep an eye out for anything in the chat, but I'm going to move us forward just for our last couple of items here. Um, one of which, now that you learned about all these, I don't know if I add this, added this as a multiple choice question, to be honest, so it might be that you're forced to choose one. Um, but just out of curiosity, which one are you thinking? If your answer is all, go ahead and add it into the chat instead, maybe. That would be easier, um, and we'll just make sure we cover you there. Uh, but this should drop in a poll shortly once uh, Roland has it in there. Um, the Q and A's, uh, the questions, if they're were read out loud, they're going to be in the recording. But if I answer them in uh, via typing, you can look at the answered questions on Q and A um, anytime. Uh, most of them are I didn't answer them live if they were uh, just quick responses for people or other in, uh, interesting questions. Um, so the live ones that were answered um, verbally will be there. Um, it doesn't look like our poll is coming down. Roland, do we, maybe we'll just write that one in the chat. If you plan to do, oh, just kidding. Maybe I can try to do it. Let's see. The poll, the last one was, which one do you plan to do? Got it. Oh, a poll has been launched already, apparently. Not sure why that happened. Oh, maybe that's why. Yeah, go ahead and answer in the chat because something is going up. I'd have to fix something else, it looks like. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, that might have been my fault. <laughs> oh, yeah, if you want to give a direct answer, it, the poll is open now, but I'll keep moving in the meantime. Uh, it looks like a bunch of you are going to try it all. And the Sun Sketcher Global Observer. Oh, that's awesome. Good. Family will be all together, so I'm trying to get all. Yes. Oh, I love how excited you all are to do all of them. Um, join us next week so you can learn how to do the other ones so you can double dip even more info. Um, excellent. Oh, yeah. If any of you are in the globe or sorry, not globe, uh, the sound or yeah, Eclipse Soundscapes uh, co data collector too, just add that into your list because you technically already do your job a week before and a week after, right? You don't have to do anything during the actual event. So pretty exciting. Um, if anyone is interested about the Safari one, I'll add it to the uh, review or the uh, follow up email too. And I'll make sure that um, you have an invitation for next week too. So uh, that said, I'm going to move us forward into the next slide. So um, as you all know, this is citizen science that we're talking about. And so citizen science during April, especially, is within the citizen science month, which is also our big goal for 1 million access science. So for size starters part in all of this, why we're connecting all the dots here, um, April is a big moment for a citizen science. It's our whole month of an excuse to really push for a lot of um, participation, whether that be for the eclipse or some other project down the line, or if any of you are invested in the um, City Nature Challenge later on, which is a bio blitz taking picture of all the life um, in your uh, wildlife in your area. So if you're interested in more than just eclipses and want to do a lot of work for scientists, um, there are so many projects that need your help. Um, and in order for your eclipse projects to count for the 1 million access science, you actually have to report it back to us, which is incredibly easy for about all of these. Um, so in the case of all of them, all you need to do is make sure that you have a SciStarter account because that's how we tie it on to our 1 million access science. And then you can join the project on our website. So all three of these are in existence on SciStarter. Um, just making sure that they're um, attached to your profile means that it will link um, there. Uh, in addition to that, if you're doing SunSketcher, uh, the SunSketcher project actually has a question at the very end that just asks you if you have a SciStarter account. And if you have one, it'll direct you to a form in which you can say, yes, I did it. And then boom, you're done. Um, as long as you know you have a SciStarter account and you can click a button saying, yes, I did it, <laughs> then you're good to go there. Uh, on the side of Eclipse Soundscapes, uh, Mary Kay actually mentioned it already, but at the very end of your form submission, you can um, add your SciStarter account email there and that'll count, that'll track across. So we'll know that you're a part of that 1 million access science. Excellent. Um, I'm going through fast for these just in case there are more questions and I see a bunch coming in as well. So we'll make sure. 
Um, and then for Globe, so the Globe Observer app is where we track everything and we're communicating with that team too. So we'll get all that data in after the eclipse too. But in order to connect your observations in all the Globe protocol, so as you're doing your practice ones during doing the clouds observation or land cover prior to eclipse day or after eclipse day, if you just love it, I do eclipse uh, clouds all, the, or sorry, uh, not eclipse, Globe clouds all the time. I love it. Um, you can connect all of your observations. And so to do that, you can go into the app for um, the Globe Observer and then click on the gear icon. I think it's in the bottom right hand corner. And then um, there's a button for connect your observations to SciStarter. And all you do is log in and approve and then you're done. And then that's it. We actually have a video uh, for that on YouTube as well if you need some help with that, which Roland will drop that link in the chat for us. Okay. That all said, um, that Women Access Science, I saw a question on there. It starts April 1st. So we have zero access science currently, although that's not actually true since people do citizen science all the time. But the second April hits, we start that count um, to get all the way to 1 million. We're hoping to get there pretty quickly too. There's, there's, there was two million, almost 2 million observations for iNaturalist at the end of April last year. And so we know we're gonna get there. We can't wait to get there. Um, and we want to make it as fast as possible. So the sooner you get involved, the sooner we get to that, and we can just blow that that um, that total, and we can try to go for another one. So um, what if we get a one million every week? Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> okay, sorry, that would be great. Except the counting is going to be fun. Um, I'm looking at some of the questions now too, just in case there's any more. Um, there is a resource for you that um, some of you were asking for some help to kind of organize your thoughts here. Um, we have a eclipse start, uh, quick start guide, or I should say not we, it's NASA. NASA has an eclipse quick start guide uh, for you. So you can go into that drive and find the worksheet for soundscapes, for example, um, some assistive materials for the GLOBE project um, and information on SunSketcher. So if you need something to kind of organize all those thoughts you have um, and to know what to print out and when, that'll give you get you started. Of course, all the websites for these projects are also wonderful and you can find all the information you need there. Again, I will send all of this in the follow-up email. We're sending you a lot of information and giving you a lot of information. Um, so it's all a lot of stuff. And thank you, Richard. I'm glad you're interested. Uh, go ahead and go to SciStar, create an account so you're ready. Um, and I'm checking through the uh, the questions really fast. Um, Carlin, that was the uh, answer to your question about how do you have the listing so you can plan all of them. That Google Drive is gonna be your best bet or, or the easiest way. Um, if you are looking at trying to get these, the recording of this, by the way, will be on YouTube and also in the follow-up email. So you'll get that information as well. And if it was said verbally, you'll have the Q&As, but we don't save the Q&A separately because um, they have people's names on them. Um, okay, to send this to parents to do with kids. Yes, please do send this along. I love that. Please send this to every one of the parents you work with um, if you're a teacher, because we would love to have them doing something really cool with their with their kiddos. Um, how many access science do we have now? I answered that one. We have not started, but soon. And then um, there is no limit to the amount of acts. So after you do the Eclipse projects, you are free to do anything every day. I have a goal for myself. I'll be doing a different project every single day. And on April 8th, it'll be like five projects. So we'll see. Um, excellent. Okay, I think I might have caught all the questions. If there is anything else, you can always reach out to us. Um, I'll go ahead and skip on to... Um, my next slide here. Um, if any of you are interested in more NASA information, we do have a Do NASA Science Live event series um, that both Gordon and Mary Kay participated in back in September. So there will be more and, and please join us. In fact, um, our next two events are eclipse related, including a NASA specific event on April 9th. So the day after the eclipse, we're actually doing a debrief of sorts. And so you can come and tell us how the eclipse was for you. What was your experience like? We'll learn from our uh, our projects uh, that are NASA related, um, some of them anyway, and then um, we'll learn what's next in science too. So you'll learn what mean what this means for the future of eclipse science and planetary science too. Um, and then we have a couple more events throughout the month of April to keep you working. So that may be City Nature Challenge. If you want to learn how to do a bio blitz, you can join us then. Um, on the 23rd, I'm doing a Project Sidewalk Power Hour, which is a basically a video game streaming situation. So it should be fun. And then on April 30th, we will celebrate because we will absolutely hit 1 million. Um, and don't let that be my last, my famous last words, please. So <laughs> keep saying it. Uh, if you ever need an update on what we're doing too, uh, you can go to our blog, uh, which is listed there and Roland will drop that in the chat as well. Awesome. Um, there was one question that I wanted to address just because it was interesting to me to think about. If you're in the International Space Station, asking my my three lovely guests here, if you're in the International Space Station, do you have any idea how often they see 
eclipses from there because I don't, they wouldn't be able to see ours like depending on where they are in well they they should be depending on if they're on the right side of the earth when the eclipse is happening they would be able to see potentially the eclipse shadow moving across the earth but i don't know if the international space station will be because i mean in, in in theory there's a point above the earth that is sort of in the path of totality right but mm -hmm. I, i'm not sure how likely it is that the international space station will be you know right at that at that exact point but there are satellite images of the eclipse shadow from the annular eclipse in october as well as others and you can see it moving across the earth and i don't know exactly where the international space station will be like what side of earth they'll be on at the right time now they may not see it as an eclipse in the same way but they they, they may be able to see the shadow that would be incredible like it's one thing to see the animation of it but to see it in real life that's like a that would be a wild experience being like, whoa, what is this line going across the earth? <laughs> well, it doesn't look like a line. It, I mean, it's like a, it's like, if you, if you, it's like, I mean, it's like a, it's a shadow. It's, it looks like a roundish shadow that's moving across. Um, gotcha. In, in the line. Yeah. That's what I meant. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In a line, but yeah. Um, <laughs> That'll be I, crazy. Hopefully. Probably somebody has tried to calculate whether they'll be able to see it during this eclipse or not, but I think it depends on the orbit of the International Space Station and exactly where it's situated and if it's at the right time, uh, because the it's a, I think the ISS takes about 90 minutes to orbit the Earth once, so it you know if it's on the right side, I would think they'd be able to see something at some point. Yeah. We'll have to find out. I'll do some research. And, and yeah, there may be some photos from past eclipses from the International Space Station, come to think of it, from that astronauts have taken. I would assume so. Yeah, I'll, OK, I'll do some research for anyone who is interested. I'll see if I can get that done before our follow up email um, goes out. But uh, if you're interested, go ahead and look it up and email me. Um, excellent. So just to close this out, because we're over the hour, thank you to anyone who's still on with us. We're so excited to have you all participate in all of these. Um, and I am very excited for you all. Uh, if you have any questions for us, you can email us at the info at SciStarter.org. You can also be trained to get more of an ego boost um, for citizen science. We have a podcast. we got messaging to project leaders. We've got a ton of projects on there in general. Feel free to look into it. Um, I'm also going to drop the HTTPS, um, 1 million acts of science.org. Um, if you want to learn more about that as well. So I'll go ahead and pause us there. And next week, for those of you who are interested in the animal behavior, we'll get a deep dive into the animal behavior, which will also apply to soundscapes. So feel free to join us um, during that one as well, which is the same link that you did to um, register for this one. It's just our SciStarter.org org slash go slash live, um, which is now in the chat for you. And you can find it on our blog too, which was posted earlier. Um, but yeah, all of this is so much information. Look forward to the follow-up email. I'm excited for you all. Um, have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. We'll see you hopefully on April 8th. Tag everyone in your posts for social media. We're excited for you. Awesome. And we'll see you next week if you join us then.